Well, good morning and welcome to worship. So glad you could join us today. Um, I'm really excited to be worshiping with you this morning. Um, happy second Sunday of Easter. Uh, we have a few announcements this morning, and so we'll get right to those. Uh, our first announcement, Bible study should be tonight going live on Facebook um, at 6 p.m. on uh, Beaver Dam United Methodist Church's Facebook account. You can just get online. Um, if you don't have us uh, liked or as one of, um, let's see, how, how does that work? I think I think you're either a friend or you like the page or you become a, you join the group or whatever it is. Um, you can do whatever those options are. <laughs> Clearly your pastor's on Facebook a lot. Anyway, Facebook Live tonight, um, I know I can do it because I did it before. We will be having Bible study tonight going through the Gospel of John. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you all there. Um, our second announcement, I just want to thank again everyone who continues to send in their tithe checks through the mail. Um, those of you who have been giving, really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. If you would like to support the ministries of this church um, in the midst of this ongoing pandemic to keep the lights on and keep these ministries going, uh, you can mail your tithe check to the church at uh, 302 North Lafayette Street, Beaver Dam, Kentucky, or you can um, technically mail them to the Parsonage, although I wouldn't recommend it, at 312 North Lafayette um, Street, Beaver Dam, Kentucky. So that's 302 is the church address. And then one more announcement. Um, feel free to post comments during the service, and uh, you know we will um, have someone responding to you, hopefully, and, and um, kind of letting you know that uh, we see you there. Uh, it's one of those great ways we have through this technology to be able to still worship together, though we are separated, though we are in our own homes. Um, some of you may still be even in your pajamas. Um, of course, this is my, uh, my pajama bow tie. Uh, but uh, anyway, feel free to post comments. Um, it's okay to talk in the middle of this church. Um, because I know you're not paying attention to my sermon anyway. So feel free to comment during worship. Um, other than that, I'm ready to begin worship. Are you? That is why we have gathered. We have gathered here this morning in our living rooms or in our homes, or maybe you're at the park or watching this um, in, in, a, in a room somewhere on a phone. I don't know where you are, but wherever we are, the presence of the Lord is in that place. And we have gathered together to worship. And so as we begin worship, will you bow with me? in prayer. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us in this hour, that uh, your Holy Spirit would descend from heaven and fill us with everything we need to worship you, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. That is why we are here. That is why we are sitting in front of these screens. That is why we are turning up volumes and, and uh, plugging in laptops and stuff. Heavenly Father, to worship you. And we thank you for the ability to do so, even though we have to stay home right now. But we know that, like that old saying goes, the uh, home is where the heart is and our hearts are with you and so you are our home. And so we ask that this hour of praise be glorifying to you. That we would lift you up. And that we would experience you right now in ways we have never experienced you before. For we ask this through the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, our call to worship this morning, um, whoops, I forgot to forward to the prayer slide, that's okay. Our call to worship this morning is gonna be brought to you by Perry Pedley and Isaac Brown. Uh, they have been gracious enough to, to offer to participate in worship and lead us in our call to worship. And so take it away, gang. Good morning. We miss you all so much, and we can't wait to see you all again. Until then, we're blessed to still be able to join together in worship. Please join us now in this responsive call to worship. I'll be reading the light print, and I invite you to join Isaac as he responds with the bold print. Hear the tremendously good news. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus is our good news, our joy, and our salvation. Our eternally faithful and relentlessly loving God stepped into time and space with the offer of salvation. God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus is alive and working in us. Well, Jesus is alive and we celebrate his resurrection this morning. We celebrate him as the Lord of life, 
We celebrate him as the Lord of love. And especially we celebrate him as the Lord of peace. I invite you to join with us on our hymn of praise this morning. It is crown him with many crowns. Join us as we sing. Psalter reading for this morning will be given to us by Becky Spurrier. She'll be leading, um, and she will let you know what it is you are to do. Today's Psalter is from Psalms 16, verses 5 through 11. Please read responsibly in the bowl of wherever you are located. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lives have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a glorious heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. The Lord is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Thank you so much, Becky. We really appreciate your participation in our worship with us this morning. At this time, it is uh, appropriate to pray. Every Sunday, uh, I have the privilege of leading the congregation in pastoral prayer. And 
Again, typically it is this time that uh, we ask for prayer requests and praise reports. And I think a big praise report that may be on a lot of our minds is the fact that uh, according to some of the most recent uh, news that has come out, we may have been flattening this curve and hopefully we are starting our way out of this COVID-19 um, pandemic. And so hopefully, hopefully soon, we will all be gathered together again here. But in the meantime, there are lots of prayer requests, and this would be the time, uh, if you are available, if you can do so, to uh, go in that little column on the side of the Facebook Live page and start to um, type in your prayer requests. We will see them. We will pray for them. But in the meantime, and feel free to do so even as I pray. That is appropriate. But in the meantime, let us bow before our God. Let us quiet our hearts. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, as we are now on the other side of Easter, can't help but to look back at the glory of that empty tomb. Just stand there for a while in awe of your majesty, of your power, of your might, and of your amazing grace. Because who are we that you would send your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to come to earth to die for us? We are sinners. And yet you loved us so much, you sent Jesus as that spotless lamb, slain for the sins of the world for my sins, for our sins, so that we might be delivered, not just to an eternity with you someday, but so that we can have the glory of your kingdom now and enjoy the presence and the relationship you offer us now. For these Wondrous gifts, Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful. That is why we come here to worship. It's why we've taken time aside. We didn't have to, but we did because we love you, because we know how much you have loved us. And so God, it is because of that empty tomb, because of what we know Jesus did, that we can trust you that we can trust what's happening in the world right now to you. We know that you've got the whole world in your hands. This is our great hope. You are our great hope. And it is why we can rest and relax in your grace in this moment, in our prayer, and as we praise. For we pray these things with thanksgiving and gratitude and humility, with all the love our hearts can give, we pray them in Jesus' name. As we now join together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I totally messed that up like I have a tendency to do. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes my mind gets focused on other things when I should be focused on something else. That'll be a pretty powerful point. It's almost like this happened on purpose, but it wasn't. It just, you all know me. But for now, we're going to have Jackie Barrett read for us our gospel reading for this morning, which comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And then you'll hopefully see how my little mistake, <laughs> because my mind was going on what was next, really plays into what Christ wants us to understand this morning. Jackie? Today's scripture is from the New Testament. The book of John, verses 19 through 31. 
That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on him and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive their sins, they are not forgiven. One of the disciples, Thomas, was not there with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into his wound on his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and look at my hand. Put your hands into the wounds by my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord, my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe me without seeing me. Disciples saw Jesus do many other miracles signs in addition to the one recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe. But Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life by the power of His name. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, thank you, Jackie, so much for participating with us in worship. We really appreciate you all doing that. You know, today marks our sixth Sunday that we as a church family have had to sacrifice worshiping our risen Savior together out of our concerns of spreading the coronavirus. Six weeks. Can you believe that? 42 days. Perhaps you're like me and, and you kind of feel like it's been 42 weeks rather than 42 days. It just seems like forever since we have been able to worship together like we would normally do. Do, do you remember what life was like back then? A lot has changed since we last met. And you know what? I miss you all. I really do. I miss you all a lot. I miss normal. Don't you miss normal? I do. I, I miss what life was like before I had to worry about staying at least six feet away from people. I miss what life was like before even... Every little tiny cough I, I make was followed by a mini panic attack as I analyzed whether or not it was a dry cough or a wet cough, right? I, I miss what life was like before I had to force myself not to touch my own face. Now, do you have any idea how hard that is when you've got a perpetual tickling machine directly under your nose? And some of you might be thinking, well, why doesn't he just shave it off? Let's not get carried away here. Seriously, though. Don't you wish things would just go back the way they were? Do you think that's what the disciples were feeling on Easter Sunday? Wishing things would just go back the way they were? As Jackie just read for us in John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. The disciples in our text for this morning, they're scared. They sacrificed a lot in following Jesus all those years, only to now see him betrayed by one of their own, arrested and crucified at what should have been his moment of absolute victory, right? Mark's gospel, chapter 14, verse 50, tells us the night of Jesus' arrest, all his disciples deserted him and ran away. And now we see them again, cowering behind locked doors. We can imagine the, the, the whirlwind of, of worrisome thoughts dizzyingly swirling in their minds. Now, now that that Sabbath was over, after Jesus' death, now that the Sabbath was over and the authorities back at work 
would they be next? Was it just a matter of time before they were caught and crucified too? And so it was, the Gospels tell us. The disciples are meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid. Now this should probably sound strikingly familiar to us right now, shouldn't it? (laughs) With everything going on in our world today, maybe we can relate to being locked behind doors in fear. In fact, just this Friday, Governor Bashir announced 134 new cases of the novel coronavirus in Kentucky in spite of all the shutdowns, all the social distancing, and all the quarantine orders put into effect for over a month now. Those 134 cases now bring the um, official total to at least 2,522 in the state of Kentucky. And of course, there's a new study that suggests that that number is more than likely much, much greater. People just don't know they have this virus. And so like the disciples, most of us have been dutifully huddled behind locked doors as we have been asked to do. And I think it's safe to say that most of us have felt some form of fear within these past six weeks, though maybe some of us would try to deny it. You know, fear, fear is an interesting thing. It is a fundamentally deeply wired reaction to danger. And it has the tendency to cause two reactions in us humans. Perhaps you've heard of them. Fight or flight. Let's look at flight first, flight. This, this is when we react to fear by retreating. So like if um, the, the, this flight tendency can happen outwardly, it's, it's like when someone tries to scare you and, and you jump back, right? That's the flight response, that, that kind of immediate response. But it can also happen inwardly, this flight reaction. Like that whirlwind of worrisome thoughts that may have been dizzyingly swirling in your own minds these past six weeks. For instance, have have you been glued to the TV, soaking up every bit of news you possibly can on the COVID-19 virus? Have you been keeping track of how many cases there are in the US, let alone how many and in which counties in Kentucky? Perhaps you also have paused for a moment when you had a cough. Or maybe you felt your forehead or taken your temperature in the last six weeks at the slightest hint of possibly feeling maybe a slightly tad bit off. Have you hesitated when when reaching out for a doorknob somewhere while your mind raced about all the possibilities of people who had touched it before you? Maybe you've gotten all judgmental at people who aren't following the basic social distancing guidelines, like that idiot at Walmart who invaded your, uh, your, your buffer zone, right, in order to grab that last can of Spam that was only six inches away from your face. You know, church, we have several members of our congregation that are still working right now. I wonder what is going through their minds as they continue to work in close proximity to others. Are you becoming paranoid of your coworkers? And of course, we have several members of our church working in the healthcare system itself, and and nurses working night shifts, long hours at hospitals, therapists and staff working at nursing and rehab centers in our county. I, I can't imagine the angst you all must be feeling in this time, this internal flight response we have. Then there's the fight reaction. Like flight, fight is a protective reaction to perceived danger. But unlike retreating, this this is reaction in action. It can happen outwardly, like in that old video where, where the guy is dressed up like a scarecrow on Halloween. Have you all seen this video? It's really funny, you can look it up on YouTube. He sits there, real still, dressed up as a scarecrow on his front porch on Halloween night. And he's sitting there real still in this costume, and as people are coming up, all of a sudden, as they're coming to reach for the candy, right? 
and possibly you just did it in your living room, I don't know, but uh, people, most people, they would scream and jump back, that flight response. That's a physical reaction to flight. But then there's this one guy, and when the scarecrow kind of jumped up at him, well, the fight instinct in him took over, and the guy just, he just cold cocked that poor scarecrow, in, 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 that poor guy in the suit, right? He just, he just hammered him with a right jaw, right to the head. Uh, a jab, right to the jaw, that's what I tried to say. I mean, just pow, right in the kisser, right? That is an outward reaction to fight. It's a reactive action in defense of a perceived threat. That instant response of fight. But you know that fight can also happen inwardly as well, just like flight can. And I wonder, churches, is this what we are seeing when people not only refuse to social distance themselves, but they flaunt it and they, they hold these coronavirus parties? Is it the fight reaction that is even driving some pastors and congregations to toss conventional wisdom out the window and gather in person for worship anyway? This coronavirus pandemic we're facing, it's caused a lot of anxiety, a lot of panic, and a ton of fear. And wouldn't you know it, the Bible has a lot to say about fear. The Bible talks a lot about fear. In our scripture reading for this morning, John tells us the disciples, they were, they were behind locked doors because of their fear, in spite of the fact that Jesus had told them time and time again exactly what would happen. And that's what's so interesting about how fear works in the human brain. It kind of makes us really dumb. The fight or flight reactions caused by fear, they're sudden, they're illogical, they are irrational. They are overreactions to the situations at hand, and it's why sometimes we even regret those reactions later. Like the guy who punched the scarecrow, he immediately apologized as soon as he kind of understood what had happened. You know the way our brain works? Of course you do, you're smart. Information is received through our senses, right? Sight, sound, smell even, touch, taste. And as I understand it, all, all that information goes to the middle part of our brain before it is then routed to the front and back part of our brains. Now that front part of our brain, it, it's what makes us uniquely human. It's where we do our thinking. This, this part of our brain right here, this is where we think our thunks. It's the rational part of us. The back part of our brain, or the bottom part, or depending on which book you read, and I read way too many websites about this, that's where we process emotions and feelings. So we can feel all the feels we're feeling. But sometimes, sometimes when there's a threat, whether it's a real threat or just a perceived threat, that middle part of our brain can kind of take over and can kind of hijack that signal and send it straight to the emotional part of our brains before the thinking part has had time to process the information. And it's precisely then that we can seriously overreact to a situation. In fight mode, it's, it's when we fly off the handle, we go stark raving mad, we make super dumb decisions and then instantly regret it the minute we've calmed down and thought about it for a second. Perhaps you've experienced this in a verbal argument or when someone cuts you off in traffic. That middle part of your brain hijacked the signal. In flight mode, I think this is when we start to lose sleep, obsessing over situations, overthinking solutions to problems that may or may not even exist. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be irrational. I want to use the brain that God gave me to logically think through the problems we face together. I, I, I don't want to be locked in fear. I want to utilize the wisdom that God has blessed us with. 
So what do we do about our fears? Well, we can go to the world. The world's got a lot of, a lot of smart things to say about fear. In fact, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said one of the most famous things, I think, about fear. Franklin D. Roosevelt famously stated, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself and spiders. But there's got to be another way. There's got to be a better way than the world because we still have fears. We can't help it. It's a natural reaction. There's got to be a better way. A way to break the endless cycle. And wouldn't you know a church? Jesus has a better way. John chapter 20 tells us that the disciples, they're meeting behind a locked door because they were afraid. But then, all of a sudden, Jesus is there. He's standing there with them. He's standing with them in the midst of all their fears and all their anxieties. There is Jesus suddenly standing with them. And listen to what he says. Jesus says to you and to me just as much as he said to the disciples 2,000 years ago, peace be with you. In fact, Jesus says, peace be with you three times in these short, short verses. That probably ought to tell us something. Peace be with you. And I love the way that Ben Witherington puts it in, in uh, the, the one book daily, weekly study of the Gospel of John. Regarding Jesus' appearing to the disciples, he says, Jesus simply suddenly appears in their midst and says, Shalom, y'all. I love that, don't you? Because I think that's exactly what Jesus would say to us today. In fact, if we were to calm down a minute, close our eyes and breathe in the midst of the fears and the anxieties that swirl around us, if we picture Jesus in our mind's eye, in our living rooms, in our bedrooms or our kitchens or wherever you may be watching us, I think we might be able to hear him say in a great, just beautiful sound in Kentucky drawl, Shalom, y'all. Peace be with you. The disciples, they were hiding behind locked doors out of fear. And again, I think we can relate, don't you? But look, Jesus entered their presence anyway. They didn't have to get their act together first. They didn't have to be doing all the right things in order to receive Jesus' peace. No, no, no. It was in the midst of their fears, locked behind doors out of fear that Jesus comes into their midst. Jesus enters their presence with his presence anyway. And that's because, church, no barrier can hinder Jesus standing with you in this crisis. There's not anything that exists anywhere for all of time that can keep Jesus from standing with you now and always. No hideout is so secret, no living room so remote that Jesus doesn't know where you are in your isolation. And that's what Jesus wants to do for you today, right now, is enter your presence and mine with his, and then offer us his peace. And it's his peace not yours, and not mine. This isn't the kind of peace achieved through self-guided meditation or, or through deep breathing exercises or, or through yoga or a self-help book or anything like that. Now, those things exist. I'm not discounting those. They have their place. But the peace 
of Jesus, the peace that Jesus offers us is vastly different and very superior because it's his peace. Not peace after I've calmed down. Not peace after I've regained control of the thought processes, the rationality of my brain. It's the peace in the midst. You've heard me talk about that before. Do you believe it? So what can we do? What can we do with our emotions? particularly when we're feeling like we're starting to maybe spiral out of control or that our our feelings are are controlling us rather than us controlling our feelings, when kind of the rationality has gone out the window and the fight or flight has taken over, what can we do? I think we can look at Thomas. Poor Thomas. (laughs) Poor Thomas. Doubting Thomas. What a a terrible nickname to have to carry around with you for 2,000 years. Doubting Thomas. As if the other disciples were any better. They didn't believe it when Mary Magdalene had come to them that morning and told them what she had seen, that she had seen the risen Jesus, that the tomb was empty, he had risen from the grave. They didn't believe it. And they were still locked behind doors in fear. And it was only after Jesus showed them his hands and his side that they were filled with joy according to the scripture. Only after Jesus had shown himself, had offered his peace, did they find joy. And notice that that's something Jesus initiated too. Jesus gives us his peace. Jesus shows us himself. Jesus saves us. Jesus does all these things. Jesus does all the work, all of it. It's all him. But you know what? Thomas wasn't with them that evening. He hadn't seen. He hadn't witnessed. And so when the other disciples had told him that they had seen the risen Savior, he says that he won't believe it unless he sees the nail wounds in Jesus' hands and the spear wound in Jesus' side. And eight days later, eight days later, all the disciples are gathered together, Thomas included this time. But did you notice they're still, they're still behind locked doors. Fear is a tricky thing. But suddenly, as before, Jesus is standing with them. Peace be with you, he says again, again for the third time. And then Jesus initiates the the action again. Jesus takes the initiative. Here, Thomas, put your finger here. Look at the holes in my hand. Put your hand in my side. Thomas, believe. And I think that's the answer for us in this time of crisis. We need to be like Thomas. Because you see, what Thomas did in the midst of all this stuff going on around him, Thomas was honest about what he was feeling. He could have gone with the boys and and, and said that he believed too that day. When they told him that they had seen the risen Savior, he could have gone along with it so he didn't feel like an idiot so that he didn't feel left out of the crowd. He could have paid lip service to his faith because that's what he should have believed. No. That's not what he did. When the disciples told him that they had seen the Lord, though his heart was screaming with doubt, he could have just gone along and said, really, that's great, but that's not what he did. Look what Thomas did. He was honest about what was going on in his head and in his heart. He said, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. So church, what should we do with our fears in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic we find ourselves in? How can I break the cycle of being locked in by fear, you may be asking? Well, let me ask you this, church. Have you told God about how you're feeling?
Have you paused for a moment to take inventory of all the things going on inside of you and given them to God? and express them to God, to talk to them, to God. Because I think that's the lesson we can learn from Thomas. Because in that gospel story, Jesus honors honesty more than mere lip service. And I pray that his peace is with you as you open yourself up in honesty to him. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, perhaps it is a consequence of the fall That when fears come in, it can, it can kind of short-circuit our brains and rationality and wisdom go out the window and we overreact in silly and stupid ways. Heavenly Father, six weeks into this health crisis, we praise you that you are still in charge. You're still the king of kings in the midst of this stuff. And as we've now maybe had time to process and think through and and maybe regain some of our rationality that you have endowed us with, oh, Heavenly Father, help us process our feelings with you. So that we might join Paul, who in the book of Philippians said, not to be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication to make our requests made known to you, not until I see the holes, not until I can put my hand in the side. Oh God, give us the ability to express what we're feeling to you with openness and honesty so that we might receive the peace that surpasses all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in you and in our Savior Jesus Christ through the power of the indwelling Spirit, who even though we can't see, we know stands with us even in this. Thank you, Jesus. It is in your name we pray. Amen. And amen. Our closing hymn this morning is a familiar one for us. It's hymn number 534, Be Still, My Soul. Wherever you are right now, may this truly be your prayer. And it may seem weird, and it may make you slightly uncomfortable, but I think it would be very powerful if wherever you're watching this, you would sing along, hearing the words and imagining them ascending to the throne of God. And our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, he hears them. And he responds, peace be with you. Let us worship our God in song together. Will you join me in singing, Be Still, My Soul.
receive your benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. God bless you.